Well, good morning, church. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Sabbath. Welcome to 2023. Amen. Yep. I really hope that 2023 will be a blessing to all of you today. Barbara. you all a blessed Sabbath. We're pleased that you have decided to join us virtually uh, to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lessons. Doctor, will you ask the Lord to bless this lesson this morning? Thank you, thank you. Let's um, pray. Our loving Lord Jesus Christ, Father God in heaven and Holy Spirit, what a blessing for us to be here talking about you through the Holy Spirit. This is the first lesson of the year, 2023. And we thank you for creating us, giving us a voice, and allow allowing us to share your word to our people. Lord, I pray that people that are coming to church today, to the Sabbath school, bless them and bring them here safely. Those who will be listening to us, be with them so that they can hear you, not us. Lord, we thank you for giving us everything under our feet, as you mentioned in Psalms 8, and making us stewards for your creation. Lord, we'll be learning about our responsibilities and how much grateful, thankful we should be towards you. Lord, we forget that all the time, and we ask that you, through this lesson of this quarter, allow us to remember that you are sovereign God over everything. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thanks so much, David. Um, this is the first week of a new quarter, a new quarter in 2023. Mm -hmm. And um, the quarter's lessons are called Managing for the Masters Till He Comes. And I just, have, I've gone through the quarterly, by the way, because I was so inquisitive as to what was going to be placed, and I'm really excited. I'm going to encourage you to listen to our teaser. Barbara uh, did a teaser for us on, on the quarter's topic, and I'm going to encourage you to do that. Just briefly, this quarter's Sabbath school lessons are designed and developed to help us study and understand God's ideal relationship with Him. The ultimate objective is to encourage us to develop deep trust with and for God. That will help us remain faithful to Him, even through the hard times we will be facing just before Jesus' second coming. And let's face it, that's just begun. This week's Sabbath School lesson is titled, Part of God's Family. And for me, this is just a delight, a delight to know that I am being groomed as part of God's family. And I hope that you are being groomed as part of God's family. The key text, text the memory text, is found in 1 John 3.1. I don't have time to explain that to you, but uh, as I do uh, my, my conclusion this evening, I will touch on it a little bit. But here's what the text tells us. Behold, and this is John writing, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And I want you to think a little bit about that as we move on. As an um, overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson, um, I, uh, I want to make the following uh, statements. In ancient Israel, worship mattered, just as it should matter today. Worship was central to the society and to the family. Israel's culture and family life was significantly influenced by religion and worship. The family was designed to serve God. God's original plan was to create a large family on earth that would be part of the heavenly family. Paul refers to that plan in Ephesians chapter 3. True religion and worship was meant to unite all people and all things in Christ. Thus, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10, 11, and 12, to the intent that manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, 
according, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which God accomplishes in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what was that accomplishment? Salvation through His death on the cross for each one of us. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. Through that sacrifice on your behalf and my behalf, I have faith in Him. As we read in Genesis chapter 1, the plan was to reveal God's character expressed in the hearts and minds of His unfallen children to its successive generation. God's blessings and gifts bestowed on His children would be used for the glory of God and to bless the world. So in Eden, God set up the first family business in the history of the planet. This family business was placed under the care of the children, Adam and Eve, and they were required to manage it in accordance with the Father's will. And you can read that in Genesis chapter 2. God explicitly delegated to Adam and Eve the personal care of, of a flawless creation. Scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 15, that the Lord God planted a garden eastward in, in Eden, and there he put the man whom he formed. And verse 9, and out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight in good and good for food. And it, that verse tells us the tree of life was also in the middle of the garden, and so was the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Now verse 15 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do two things, to tend it and to keep it. As instructed by God, Adam named the animals. He kept the garden and he filled the earth with children. And in so doing, Adam and Eve worked on God's behalf here on the earth. You see, when sin came into the world, the Bible tells us in John 3.16 that God sent His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to save each family member. And so today, God sent us out, redeemed and rehabilitated by Christ's grace to, to labor in His name. An amazing feature about our relationship with God is that as Christians, God trusts us to manage His affairs on the earth. To this end, we find God seeking children to work for Him, children who faithfully return the proceeds of His business that was entrusted to them. We also find God calling children from among those who keep His commandments to work with and for Him with the gifts He has bestowed on them because they love Him. We also, uh, and these workers, as Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, become a blessing in the church, in the world, until God's work in us and through us is completed and we return to the Father's house as a family. You see, my brother and my sister and my friend, God's ultimate goal is to get the family together forever. And so in John 14, 1 to 3, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. God's family together. In this week's Sabbath School study, we will explore the privilege and responsibilities of being a part of the family of God. Barbara, we are part of God's family. Absolutely. Correct? Absolutely. And let, let's think about this for just a minute. God at one time had a perfect family, didn't he? Yep. In heaven. And this family got along very harmoniously until Satan walked in the picture and decided he knew better. And so we see that conflict ensued. And when Satan left heaven, I'm not even sure at, the at that time he fully understood 
what he had done and how, he, how destructive he had been to this beautiful family. So God chose to create a new planet with the intent to create a new family with added responsibility for this family. This family had the ability to recreate. So as we recreate, and there's nothing like holding that newborn babe. So we are actually given the opportunity to understand somewhat the kind of love God has for us as we have for our children. Amen. The other uh, piece we want to look at is Genesis 2.7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This shows true intimacy. Everything else God spoke into existence, and we've talked about this before, but God took man, the dirt of the ground, the clay, and he formed and molded his masterpiece and then gave it life. So God truly was our creator. He was, our, our, he, he was just a, a, a genius in, 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 the, in the art of forming man. And so we see this, this beautiful warmth that they had walking in the garden on a day-to-day -day basis. Then something happens. Again, Satan appears. And this intimacy that Adam and Eve had with God was destroyed. And it gets, it even got worse because not only now was this intimacy um, broken and fractured that they had with God, but very, very soon we see that Cain kills Abel. And that means then the earthly family is then fractured as well. So we see so early in Scripture this division. We see it again in Genesis 6-4, when it talks about the giants on the earth in those days, and also after that the sons of God and the daughters of man coming together. So we see that there had been a split, and that different families were, were following different ideologies. They were either choosing God or they were choosing not to follow God. So God's, so as mankind grew from Abraham through Joseph, the numbers of, of Hebrews grew and grew and grew until they became a very large family in Egypt. And at this point, God decides to organize and bring his children into the, the um the promised land that he had for them. And the, the rest is, is, shall we say, history, because we saw how the, the nation at first allowed God to be their, their king. Then they wanted a human king, and so they pushed God further and further away. But we have assurance now that we are children of God, we can see this beautiful imagery in Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth were named. Amen. So early in Jesus' ministry, he states, In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Later, he repeats it to his disciples, where he says, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus call, told us we could call, to call him his Father, our Father in heaven. We see that after the resurrection of Mary, she wanted to embrace him. And Jesus said, Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus truly understood this closeness and intimacy. As we look in John 20, 17, um, um, we, we, we see this, her, him explaining the scripture to Mary that he needed to ascend to his Father. Because we have the same father as Jesus, 
That makes Jesus our what? Our brother, doesn't it? And so we are all brothers and sisters of the Lord. Jesus became a member of the earthly family so that we could become members of the heavenly family. The family of heaven and the family of the earth are one. And that is, comes from, um, that's in our lesson and comes from Desire of Ages, page 832. In Exodus 3.10, we see, Come now, therefore, we see, we see um, Moses going to Pharaoh. God says, Bring my people out of Israel. In Exodus 3.10, in Exodus 5.11, he says, um, um, Moses and Aaron, when they go to Pharaoh, he says, Thus the Lord say, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast for me in the wilderness. How important it is it, the family meals? <laughs> and and it, that, that just brings a, a new level of intimacy. Galatians 3.26 and 29, For you are all sons of God, through our faith in Jesus Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Revelation also shows us that God has a greater plan for his children. And that is when we go to heaven. And Revelation 7, 9 says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude no man could number, of all the nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palms in their hands. Can you imagine the scene? That, that's when we'll all get to see our extended family for the first time. In verse 14, it says, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Where they shall no more hunger or thirst, Neither shall the sunlight be on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which was in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. So God's plan is to reunite us as a family. That is harmonious. So... To, to, in, in closing out this, this, this lesson, I just want to read to you from Upward Look. So God calls for a change among his people because, truthfully, this change that he's calling upon is for us to be practice being a harmonious family now. Union with Christ and with one another is our only safety in these last days. Let us not make it possible for Satan to point to our church members saying, Behold how these people, standing under the banner of Christ, hate one another. We have nothing to fear from them while they spend more strength fighting one another than in the warfare of my forces. And that often happens. And so we have to, as, as church members, we want to guard against that. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, the disciples went forth to proclaim a risen Savior. Their one desire, the salvation of souls. They rejoiced in the sweetness of communion with the saints. They were tender, thoughtful, self-denying, willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. I want to say that again. Willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. In their daily association with one another, they reveal the love that Christ had commanded them to reveal. By unselfish words, deeds, they strove to kindle this love in hearts of others. So in contrast to a view of creation in which we are deemed mere products of cold, uncaring natural laws, Scripture teaches us that not only that God exists, but that he loves us and relates to us in such a loving man man manner that the imagery of family is as so often used in scripture to depict the relationship. Whether Jesus calls Israel my people or us as sons of God or refers to God as our father, the point is it's still the same. Thanks so much, Barbara. It is, you know, David and Barbara, it's so wonderful for me to know that I am part of God's family. Yeah. And then Monday's lesson, David, yeah. tells me that he owns everything. Yeah. Could you unpack that for us? Well, you know, what's the most profound verse in the Bible? 
for me, is Genesis 1-1. <laughs> I mean, there has been, you know, um, <coughs> theses written, yes. PhD yes. given over that one verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> That is on itself is going to be something that will be studied for eternity. Amen. So let's go to Isaiah 66, 2. And it says, my hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts who tremble at my word. You see. The good news that God is the creator of everything, what's the real message? We're going to be blessed. That's exactly that right. is the key here. Exactly. Nothing to be afraid, right? Exactly. That to me is the most important thing. Because God is creator, we're going to be blessed. Psalms 24, 1, it says, earth and all that dwells on it are God's. Yes. Again, in um, Haggai 2, 8, it says, both silver and gold belongs to God. So elements... All the creatures, everything is God's creation. What about plans, Victor mm -hmm. and Barbara? Mm -hmm. Daily, mm -hmm. day-to-day, minute-by-minute plans. Well, Do you believe it's by God, directed by God? They need to be. They, if, if, if my plans are not, David, then yeah. there is a problem. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, but every interaction, every situation, God is in control, okay? Yeah. What about people say, oh, what about the blind or the disease? You remember the story when Jesus healed the blind man? And they said, why does this happen? Who sinned? And Jesus said, nobody, but the glory of God can be revealed. See, every situation is planned by God. God says, I, Isaiah 45, 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, Lord, do all things. Why? Because we need to see everything. God doesn't hide anything right. from us. Now, I want to talk to you about the story of David. You know David, man after God's heart. Mm -hmm. I didn't kill anybody. David killed a lot of people, right? But he's still man after okay. God's heart, okay? So what is going on here? David loves the Lord. He really loves the Lord. He, wa he wrote so many Psalms, right? And all these things that we know about him. Guess what? Because of King David, a lot of us are going to go to heaven because we read his things, right? So here, David says, you know what? I live in this castle in Jerusalem. I want to build something for the Lord. And then um, prophet um, says... Um, that you know, do everything that is in your heart, right? And David says, okay, I'm going to build the temple. But guess what? The Lord. the Lord sends the prophet and says, you know what? Um, you can't because you have too much blood in your hand. But you know what's amazing? If I would have said that to God and he told me that, I would be a little depressed. I'll be like, oh, I wanted to do this. But guess what David does? He actually really loves the Lord because God, I'm sure, was testing him what he yeah. really and meant. He, he, accepted that. he accepted that. And not only he accepted exactly. that, he worked to exactly. gather all the materials exactly. that are necessary. So Essentially, his, his son could yeah. build. Yeah. So, Victor, what is difficult, Barbara, what is difficult before a job we start is to find a job, get yes. all the resume together and everything else. Here, David essentially builds the foundation of the temple. And not only he does that, later on, let's go and read First Chronicles 29. He gathers all the assembly and he actually praises God. You know, there is no greater way to praise and thank God than to do the work that David did. And here, he not only does the work, but he also recognizes that God gave everything. He's just doing the work, okay? And that's also God's plan. So let's go and read First Chronicles 29. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. This is what we see in Revelation. John says it, the same thing, John, Revelation 5.4. Uh, five, For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted as head over all. See, and then wealth and honor comes from you. You are the ruler of all things in your hands. Our strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. See, David um, here teaches us a lesson. For young people, this is a lesson. When you go to work, no matter what kind of work it is, give your 100% right. at the work. Why? Because you think about it. Go to church, 
you know, versus going to work. In work, we have to be in our best professional behavior. We have to like people who do not like us. Sometimes we have to show customer service to people who complain. What better place to practice the love of God Amen. than go to work, okay? So don't take work uh, and don't underestimate work because it is almost like also a practice ground for us to be heavenly citizens, okay? Now, let's talk about um, what does, you know, in a God, He directs, what does He direct in our life? We already talked about it. He directs, He created us, right? And he brought us, He saw our substance being formed. So He gives life. So all of us that are alive, that came to this earth as human beings, guess what? That's God's plan. Mm -hmm. That is God's plan. Time. God gives us time. You know, time to do this. Right. There's a time for everything. God gives us talent, mm -hmm. okay? And He gives uh, he plans for all this right? right so a lot of people don't realize that but money comes from time and talent sure. because to earn money you have to have the talent and you have and to spend time, time to do earn money so money is not only equal to money it has to do tied with the talent and time so um, uh, let's talk about time time um, in Galatians Paul says that be, you know, be, make the best use of time. For talent, 1 Corinthians, Paul says that God gives all the gifts and he empowers everyone. So talent, take it seriously. Now, what is our responsibility? Tithe. Tithe is our responsibility. Now, what, what is the, why did God institute tithe? Let's go and read Deuteronomy 14, 23. It says, You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name. The tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and firstborn of your herd and flock, so that you may learn to do what? Fear the Lord your God always. We must appreciate. So God told us to give tithe of everything. Honestly, we only think money, but it's actually everything that God gives us, we must think about giving back at least 10%, right? Sabbath is like the 10% of the time in a week. Do you know what the 10% of the time in a day is? 24 hours, 10% is 2.4, but people sleep. So you get about 18 hours, so 1.8. So anywhere from 1.6 to 2.4 is the time we should spend with God. Just a thought, but we need to remember that because it's all about relationship. So what is the greatest gift God gave us? What is the greatest gift? Jesus Christ, right? And, and the problem is that we forget Jesus, that he is the one that is our greatest gift. You know, the most interesting thing is, in, um, who is the best steward of all this, of anything? The owner is always the best steward of his property, right? So in Psalms 8, God made us actually the owners of everything that he has. He just wants us to remember that. It says, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. So the, in summary, I wanted to tell you about um, uh, Monday's lesson quickly. So God is in control of everything because he's our creator, and that's why we're blessed. He has plans for everything. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you plan to give you peace and prosperity. Now, money is divided into three things, time, talent, and tithe. And we need to remember that God is in control of all that. We just have one responsibility. What do we do to give God back? So that is the key. So on Monday's lesson, since God is the creator of all things, we are blessed. But let's also show him the respect that Amen. he needs. Amen. Thanks so much, David. So we, we know that we can be part of God's family. We know that God is the owner of everything. And David already mentioned one vital resource. And I'm going to spend my, a little bit of my time discussing the resources available for God's family. And I'm going to mention some spiritual and material resources very briefly in the time allocated to my presentation. So God's greatest resource or gift to his children as Dr. David mentioned, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the greatest resource and the greatest gift that God has given us. When we accept and invite Jesus to be part of our lives, we experience forgiveness in our sins, and this provides peace of mind. We acquire Christ's grace for our daily living and spiritual growth. This grows our belief and our faith in God, it grows our trust in Christ and provides the hope of eternal life. 
God's Word tells us in John chapter 3, 16, just that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You, you probably know that as I do by memory. Now, when we accept and invite Jesus to be part of our lives, we become sons of God. That's how we become sons of God. As John tells us in John chapter 1, verses 12, where he says, But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. I hope that you are able to see that on the screen. One of the second resources and gifts that I, I really wanted to talk about is salvation. Salvation is the foundational, the most important gift we receive from God through Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Salvation. And salvation is the only gift that provides eternal life and ensures a perpetual relationship with God. No other gift is as meaningful and relevant as the gift of salvation. And so it is essential that we treasure daily the gift, the gift of the gospel because the gospel brings us to the understanding of who Christ is and salvation. And God. And God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2, Paul tells us, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The cross of Jesus is the central message of the gospel to the believer and to the Christian faith. He ascended to heaven. It must be the center of our thoughts when we think in terms of the cross and what Jesus did for each one of us. In and of ourselves, we do not have the desire or power to be faithful. It is by God's grace that we are moved to be in harmony with the Lord's will. Jesus gave himself for us. And when he went back to heaven, he did not leave us alone. So here's the third significant gift. When Jesus told his disciples that he was returning to heaven, he promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to comfort them. This is a significant gift for you and for me. Here's what he promised, as we read in John chapter 14, verses 15. Uh, it says, uh, John 14, verses 15 to 17. If you love me, says the Lord, keep my commandments. And then verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another helper, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, that he may abide in you forever. Verse 17. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. In John 16, verses 13, John tells us that he, the Spirit, will guide you into all truth. So he is the source of truth. He is truth, guide us into truth. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus remains with us. Through the Holy Spirit, which is a significant source and a major gift from God, we will enjoy Christ's presence and His power. We will also be provided with His harmonizing spiritual gifts. Now, first Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11, talks about these gifts and describes them. I'm not going to read all this for you. I just want to read verses 4 to 7. And I want to encourage you to, verse, to read verses 8 to 11. Here's what it says. There are diverse, verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences in ministries, but the same Lord. Verse 6. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God. The same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one of us for the profit of all. And then, as I mentioned, verses 8 to 11 describes these gifts. Fourthly, 
But God gives us so much more than just Jesus, salvation, and the Holy Spirit, or the angelical host, gives us much more. As we read in Genesis chapter 2, material possessions are also gifts from God. After all, as we, as we, as we saw, He owns everything. To those who were concerned about their food and clothing, Jesus offered comfort by saying, as we, read, as we read in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 19, Paul tells us, And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So He is the provider. You see, in Eden... Our first parents received a vast and valuable property filled with animals, with plants, and with treasures. But they could not eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. There was no poison in the fruit that caused it to be forbidden. Rather, as we read in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, God placed it off limits to test their fidelity to Him and to His law. See, the desire for the portion that God forbade generated the disobedience and sin that led humanity to suffer the penalty of death. Today, we also receive material possessions, some of us more and others less, but the test of Eden is repeated every day in our lives. God expects His children to be faithful in material possessions so that we won't repeat in our own experience, the desire for the portion uh, God withholds for himself. And one of the minor prophets in Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, 8, makes it clear. Here's what it says. Will a man rob God? And then Malachi goes on to say, you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you, O Lord? in tithes and offerings. Our faithfulness and character are being tested for eternal life. Only through the outworking of the Holy Spirit are we able to acknowledge God as our Creator, as our Father and our God. So in summary, very briefly, the God in whom we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28, and the God who gives us all life, the breath, that we breathe, and all things, Acts 17, 25, is the God who has given us existence, the promise of salvation, material blessings, and spiritual gifts in order to be a blessing to others. Therefore, whatever material possessions we have, whatever gifts of talents we have been blessed with, we are indebted in every way to God in how we use those gifts. Barbara. Yes. As members of God's family, what are our responsibilities? Well, we do have responsibilities. You know, and I think about this growing up in a, in a family of five on the, out in the country. We had our chores to do. We had our animals to feed. We had uh, our beds to make. We had, we had our own responsibilities. But I think first and foremost, being part of a family the part of being part of a family that we most crave and desire and share is that of love, isn't it? And so um, we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament that God wants love. As we are told in Genesis 127, God created man in his image, and in, it, in it, the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And so as he, if we're created in his likeness, just as we desire love, so God desires love. Amen. Deuteronomy 6, and we, we see this in both the Old and New Testament. Deuteronomy 6 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's a lot of love when you put your, all your strength into it. Matthew twenty two thirty seven says, Jesus said unto him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
And so whether we're using our strength or our mind, God desires us to love us with every part of our being. But when he says love, especially in this world where many of us really don't understand love well, we have grown up in dysfunctional families. We've seen a lot of things called love that really aren't love. But God gives us a definition. I remember they, there was a book uh, a long time ago written, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus or something, and talk, talked about love languages. And so we're going to get into what God's love language is here. What does it mean to be love? And interesting, the Bible gives us an answer for this. And it probably isn't what most of us expect. Uh, but let's look at Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God. So fear God. And fear means reverence, doesn't it? To walk in all his ways. So that means to walk as Jesus Christ walked on earth, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and here's the kicker, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. So these commandments we see in this scripture are for our good. So this this love that God is asking us to do by keeping his commandments is for our good as well as honoring him with love. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. So God, the love of God is keeping his commandments. So, you think keeping the law, obeying commandments? So, many Christians today, this is a pretty um, hard pill to swallow. Because many feel that the, the law was done away with. And that it's legalism that if we keep the law, especially the fourth commandment, we see. Um, I, I've, I've, in fact, I've had friends who would keep all of the other commandments, but would call me a legalist would, would, because of the fourth commandment, yeah. So simply to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. However, God is clear. We reveal our love to God and to our neighbors by keeping his commandments. So as, as we talked about in these other religions, we, we hear that this that, that the commandments were done away with, that, that they, were, they, they were nailed at the cross. So let's look at a few others. Uh, we want to look at Matthew 7, 21 through 27. And we want to enjoy keeping God's commandments, and we want to enjoy experiencing his love. So let's, let's read this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so that's, that's, a, that's a frightening thought because here we think we, we um, are, are, are ready for heaven just because we're coming to church. But he says, it goes on, but says, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So, so those who, who don't enter the kingdom of heaven will not enter because they're not doing the will of the Father. Many will say to me in that, do that day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, depart, I never knew you, depart from me, who, you who practice lawlessness. So this definition of struggle, even though we think we have a relationship with God, casting out demons is a, is a pretty big um, pretty big deal, actually. Um, and, and prophesying in his name. We see a lot of prophets today prophesying. But we are practicing lawlessness when we do not keep his commandments. 
So verse 24 says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. So if we listen to God's word, we're building a firm foundation by following true, being, and being true to his word. Amen. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. So it's important that we're, as we're studying the Bible, that we are looking at what God's truth is, and not that of self or man, but rather God's word. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Jesus said, those who hear and do the words are likened to the wise builder whose house was built upon the solid rock. Those who hear but do not obey are likened to the foolish builder. But we want to be, don't we? We want to be the wise builder mm -hmm. who builds our, our home firmly, firmly on solid ground. So often times we tr tr uh, struggle with this concept of keeping God's commandments because we are human and we do fail. And often times we get discouraged and lose hope. And maybe the reason for that is our focus. That our focus is on self rather than God. Matthew 19, 26 says, but Jesus beheld them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So what can I do but that which Jesus Christ can do in me? So it's not what we do ourselves, it's what Christ does in us. And I want to finish this by reading Steps to Christ. He was trying to become holy by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. All that man can do without Christ is polluted with selfishness and sin. It is the grace of Christ alone through faith that can make us holy. Obedience is not an ear, mere outward compliance. That's kind of a hard pill to swallow too. Obedience is not an outward compliance. But the service of love, the law of God is an expression of his very nature. It is an embodiment of the great principles of love, and hence his foundation of his government in heaven and earth. It is our hearts are renewed in the likeness of God. If the divine love is implanted in the soul and not the law of God be carried out in life, when the principle of love is implanted in the heart, man can be renewed after the image of him who created him. The new covenant is promise filled. I put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. And if the law is written in our hearts, will not that shape the life? Obedience, the service of allegiance of love, is the true sign of discipleship. Amen. That's great. Those responsibilities are so, so fundamental. When I build my character <clears throat> in Christ the rock through the Holy Spirit, I mean, good ground. Ah. David. Yes. Thursday's lesson. Oh. Treasure in heaven. You know, Barbara, that, uh, that topic you guys mentioned that, uh, you know, that even the very elect will be deceived. It's exactly. It is, um, it is a really interesting concept and it scares everybody. I realized, I was thinking about it, Satan kept the law perfectly. Guess what? His heart was elevated and he threw down Jesus and he wanted to be his own king. Amen. And that is, himself, yeah, God. you put it, yeah. yep. And, and that, that's why we fail. That's, that's it. it. So good work tend to elevate our spirit. Amen. And bring boasting and pride and lead us into death. Exactly. That is what the problem is. So Thursday's lesson, treasure in heaven. Thank you for that. That is just amazing. So when we think of treasure, we're thinking about money right? In this earth, mm -hmm. we're thinking about power, position, because they all bring money, okay? Time, if we spend enough time, if we use our talent properly, we earn money, okay? But the real treasure is Jesus, who gives us what? 
heavenly citizenship. So, if we are citizens of heaven, where should we store our treasure? In heaven. In heaven. Why do we need to? Yeah, why do we have to store treasure here? It's a temporary place. Yes, exactly. Heaven. 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 Exactly. Heaven. So, you know, you read that John 14, 1 to 6. You know, Jesus is saying, I'm going back to make, you know, to my father's house. There is a house, there is dwellings and mansions or whatnot. And that's, that's a place, right? It's a place, physical place. Do we really believe that, Victor? Do we? That's the struggle, right? Believing that is really the issue. Now, you mentioned God gave us one of the gifts is eternal life. That is the heavenly citizenship is eternal. Okay. So, um, and since, um, you know, we have that heavenly citizenship through Jesus Christ, that's that's our greatest treasure through Jesus. Guess what? We're supposed to give that treasure to somebody else. Exactly. You know, so you can't get a treasure exactly. unless we give that treasure exactly. to somebody else. We need to share, share the treasure. So the one treasure. thing you mentioned, Barbara, about the Israelites being keeping the commandments. I was listening to some of these things that they way keep the Sabbath and all this. What happens is they were so enmeshed with their traditions that instead of putting God first to be the light to other countries, they wanted to keep the light to yep. themselves and becoming condemning to others. So sure. they did not see Jesus Christ through all the commandments. So that's the thing. That's the real treasure, right? And so what is the problem? Why can't we store treasure here? Because when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, you will surely die. So with Adam and Eve, because they were the owners, they had the, you know, they had the dominion over all things. They're the king and the queen. They, since they died and they were dying, everything else was going with them, right? Uh, A kingdom without king and queen is no kingdom at all. So, and then guess what happened? Adam and Eve condemned each other. So they put each other under judgment. When God asked Adam, what happened? He said, oh, Eve, Eve did it. And Eve like, what happened? Oh, it's the the snake. So what do we do in this earth? You know, we, our intentions are not pure on this earth. Genesis 6, 5, God says, you you read Genesis 6, 4. Then the Lord saw and the wickedness man was uh, wickedness of man was great on earth, and here it is the here's the clincher, and that every intent of the thoughts of their heart was evil. evil. Continue. Continue. No matter what we do exactly. in our mind, it's difficult to control that's this exactly selfishness. Exactly. And you know that's why Jesus, what he did, think about it. He even in his mind he could never have any selfish thoughts right. because he was there for all of us. So our intentions are not pure. Everything else on this earth is temporarily because temporary because of that guess what that impure intentions the corruption of the heart has three components you have the pride okay pride i'm better than everybody jealousy that means oh you have something i I don't like it i want it i I want it i don't like it envy is you have something i'm gonna get it it. i'm gonna get it guess what satan ezekiel 28 17 it says your heart was lifted up because of your beauty you so pride you corrupted your wisdom jealousy and your heart was filled with violence you would kill adam and eve you would kill the one third of the angels in fact you would kill yourself to get that crown you know and you want to ultimately he he helped kill jesus right Right. so another problem with money there's a study done by paul piff in uc arvine famous Mm -hmm. psychologist Mm -hmm. if you guys have time go look at it he says that he did an experiment with monopoly game and he says that the more money people had in a Monopoly game, the more mean they became. And then the more money that they had, they tried to tell that it's their own talent, even though the experiment started with giving them extra money. So Jesus, and again, when his disciples came back to him and they said, oh, you know, we are able to cast out demons. Then Jesus said, you know what? Don't marvel at that. Marvel at the fact that your names are written in heaven. Amen. So what is the real treasure? Yes. We got to marvel at our citizenship exactly. in heaven. Nothing right. in this earth should not be marveled. Right. Even if we cast out demons in the name of Jesus, what are we right. doing? We're actually doing it for Jesus. This is nothing of our own doing. And that is the thing. Now, when the Sabbath school lesson talks about Abraham, okay, and this is a very important and interesting thing. It, That's true. You know, the memory, memory um, text for the Thursday was Matthew 6, 19, 20. It says, do not lay up uh, for, for yourself treasures on earth because everything is destroyed. Right. But 
will lay up the treasures in heaven because nothing will be taken away there. And then verse 21, I love this. It says, for where your treasure is, there your there heart will your be. Heart. So what happened with Abraham? Abraham had a lot of money, you know, and wherever he went, he brought God to them. Okay, so he was well known. They called him a prince. People made treaty with him. See, when we have money, we need to bring God to people. Sure. But the most important thing, Abraham never cared for his mm -hmm. money. You know what? His greatest treasure was his son Isaac. Mm -hmm. Guess what? He was willing to give up Isaac for God. Why? Because he loved God that much. And by willingly do that, <clears throat> guess what? He brought us salvation. Through for Jesus, you know, he brought Jesus, Jesus Christ through his life. Yeah. So what he did, he gave up his treasure through Isaac so that we can have salvation. So in the, knowing all this, what we really need to realize that in this earth, we are cursed, okay? Because sin brought us cursed. But Jesus said, I did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Exactly. He lifted up the curse. He gave us the treasure, the eternal life. Mm -hmm. So in this new year, in this new year, um, I have uh, some steps that I put on my slides, uh, you know, and the steps are the treasures. How do we store treasures in heaven? Number Good. one for me is forgiveness. Yes. And the reason why I say that, if you look at the Lord's Prayer, it's so interesting. Everything we do in the Lord's Prayer is what God does for us. But right. on 13, verse 13, uh, verse 12, it says, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And verse 14 actually reiterates that. Jesus says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive, forgive you. you. So we, do we not, need to forgive we need in to, order to be forgiven. Yeah, and that is the key because we don't yeah. put each other on condemnation against right. one another, just like Adam and right. Eve did, right? They actually condemned each other in addition to Satan. Accept no prior praise. In New Year, this year, that you know what we need to realize, Luke 17, 10, when we do something good, I want to be praised. But Jesus said, you know what? You did your part. So say, I just did my part. And all praise goes to Jesus. And the third one, keep my mouth shut from evil and my lips Amen. from speaking deceit. What does that mean? That means Jesus is going to brought every idle words to judgment. So the only word that be coming out of our mouth is praise and thanksgiving for Amen. God's love Amen. through Jesus Christ Amen. and tell other people that, the gospel. Then we need to work for Jesus. Commandments, uh, the most important commandment is go and tell the world. the world. Matthew 28, 19, 20, because we have no righteousness. And then we just read, Jesus said to believe, believe, believe. He used believe three times on John 14. Believe, believe. Do we believe? Are we part of heaven, citizen? If we don't yep. believe it, we're not going to go to heaven. Exactly. Because if I don't believe I can come to America, why do I want to go to America, right? Mm -hmm. If I don't believe if I'm, that I'm part of heaven, I'm not going to be going to heaven. Another thing, money. There's nothing wrong with money, but it is time and talent. And also tithe. See, like we mentioned, Abraham. Abraham had the money, the time, and the, and the talent. Right. But he also was willing to give up his son. That's correct. And he all, we also know he gave tithe to Melchizedek, right? Now, finally... For me, you know, uh, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Every day, we yes. need to test our hearts yes. to see if we truly love Jesus yes. by seeking his will yes. to find him when you search for him with all our hearts. Everything must be directed to the advancement of God's loving character expressed in Jesus. God says that he examines us, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. So, and God wants us to examine ourselves. Because if we do, do not examine ourselves, guess what? Pride will sneak in. Right. The boastfulness will sneak in. We're gonna, we want it to be praised. We won't forgive people. We won't ask for forgiveness. We will look at the law and we'll right. be prideful. All these things. So investigative judgment, Victor, is part of our life, right. a Christian life. And that is what it's all about. So treasures in heaven is the only way we're going to make it. Otherwise, we won't. And thank you for that. Thanks so much, Doc. I, I just want yes, Barbara. I, I Say one thing, but I think ahead. I think the key in this is: Do we really believe that our the resources are God's? Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. That's exactly. Because if I invite exactly. you over for lunch, I believe it. It's to my house. Yeah, it's, it's come to the house God gave me. That's yeah, exactly. Right. The, except exactly. no praise whatsoever. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. An incredible lesson. I, I have a feeling, guys, that yes. uh, this, this is going to be the type of studies that we are going to do throughout this Practical, quarter. very practical. Pra very practical. Yeah. We're going to review ourselves, yeah. our minds, the, our behavior, and so on. Final thoughts, just uh, a few final thoughts uh, for, for, for this particular uh, time before we pray and ask the Lord to bless us today. 
We serve a God that loves us unconditionally and owns an inexhaustible storehouse of resources and gifts. You have heard it today. All these resources and gifts have been stored for us, for God's children, for God's family. And you've got to believe that you are a member of God's family. I believe, yep. If you've accepted Amen. Jesus in your life. Amen. And if you are determined to, wa to walk with him every day. Mm -hmm. In John chapter 10, verses 30, Christ tells us that my father and I are one. In John 16, 15, Christ tells us that all things that the father has are mine, says Jesus. In John chapter 1, verses 12, and I'm reading now from the New International Version, God tells us, those who receive Christ, to those who believe in His name, God gave the right to become children of God. And then, in Luke chapter 22, verses 29, and I want you to pay attention to this verse, Jesus tells us that, I bestow upon you a kingdom says Jesus, mm -hmm. just as my Father bestowed on me a kingdom. This tells me that Jesus sits at the right hand of God and receives supreme honor as God, and that He distributes His resources and gifts to all who by faith in Him are God's family and claim these gifts and blessings. What an incredible love. We have an inexhaustible storehouse of resources and gifts. We've spoken, the three of us spoken, about an ocean of divine love that is measureless. God placed, places in Christ's hand all the treasures and the spiritual and material gifts stored in the heavenly storehouse and makes these available to human beings in order to convince you and I, fallen human beings, sinful human beings, that God loves us. Christ sprinkles every gift He provides with His own blood so that you and I become aware of His grace, the divine grace of God and His love for the fallen, fallen beings. Mm -hmm. And then John describes this incredible be, uh, uh, love as we read um, uh, the memory verse, 1 John 3, 1, as behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. There is no evaluation of height or depth or, or breadth. breadth. Yep. Nothing. So much is that love. Mm -hmm. Ellen G. White, in Thoughts for the Mount of Blessing, pages 110, mm. she writes this incredible paragraph, and I want you to pay attention to it. She says, if you have renounced self and given yourself to Christ, you are a member of the family of God. She tells you how you become a member of the family of God. And everything in the Father's house is for you. Mm -hmm. All the treasures of God are open to you. Both the world that now is and that which is to come. The ministry of angels, the gift of His Holy Spirit, the labors of His servants, all are for you, she says. And then the last statement she, she writes in this paragraph says, the world and everything in it is yours so far as it can do you good. I want to ask you, mm -hmm to pay particular attention to how much God has done to bring you into His family. So let's bow our heads and let's thank God for His incredible love. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank You for an incredible love. John was so, so contemplating Your love. He was so afflicted by the fact that he couldn't define it. No measure could measure its height, its breadth, and its width, or its deep depthness. Lord, you're an incredible God. And so, Father, 
you are telling us today that you want us as part of your family. You are telling us today not only that you want us part of your family, but you own everything. Everything that we have is yours. The gifts that you've provided through the Holy Spirit are yours given to us. The angels that protect us are yours. Everything that we own is all yours. And you are saying that you want us to have it all. But Lord, you also tell us that you want us to respect what you give us. That you want us to see our loyalty towards you as we return back to you part of that which you require from us. And Lord, as you want us to share with others the gifts and the love, the incredible love that you've given us through Jesus, salvation, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. I want to ask, O oh Lord, that you help us being responsible and that, Lord, as we look at you every day through the Holy Spirit, that our character may be molded daily to reflect you and to be built in you the rock of life. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Happy everyone. Sabbath. Happy Thank Sabbath. Thank you so much. Thank you.